Thanks, Bronwyn. So yes, I work in the public health team at the London Borough of Hounslow, and I've been project managing our switch campaign, um, but working very closely with our colleagues in the transport team there as well. It's the first project where we really worked jointly together on that. So I'm going to reflect on our experiences of um, delivering our campaign, and our, our target group were uh, the parents of children who are starting school for the first time. Um, and you'll see some similarities between our campaign and Gdansk later on, so I'm going to be leaving some elements of it to them to showcase um, what they did. But I want to start with a, a question. So if you could put your hands up if you've moved house in the last few years. <coughs> OK, how about anyone who's started a new job? Um, and if you've got children, had a child start at a new school? Yeah. OK, so those are all life change moments. So there are times in our life when our everyday habits have been disrupted. And that's really important when it comes to active travel, because the way that we commute to school or to work is so ingrained in habit that actually it can be really hard to shift. So if you think about your journey to work, you probably leave home at the same time every day. You probably go the same route in the same mode. And you don't even think about it. Have you ever had that experience where um, on a weekend you might go and get in the car and start driving somewhere, and about halfway you suddenly realise, I've started driving to work, just because you weren't concentrating? I know I definitely have had that. Um, and it's because you've got these habits that you fall back on, and in times when you're stressed or you're not properly concentrating, you'll fall into these habits. Um, so if we're trying to shift um, behaviour of the parents who are taking their children to school, the time we need to act is when they are forming those habits for the first time. So just take a moment to imagine that you're a parent and your child is starting school this September. So in the few weeks beforehand, you're going to start thinking about how we're going to um, get them to school. So you'll be thinking about what time do we need to get up? What time do we have to have breakfast? How are we all going to get out of the house without having a big fight or a tantrum? Who's going to take them to school? How am I going to get on to work after that? Many things that you'll be considering at that point and that's in those sort of first few weeks before you, um, your child starts school. So that's what we targeted our campaign around, was looking at that particular moment. So to do this, we went back one more step. So we went to the June or July, so before they've, um, they've even started the school. We started talking to the parents at the events they go to, the induction events. You know the kind of events where um, you're going to find out, how do I pay for the dinner? for the children, where do I get their school uniform, what time do they need to turn up on the first day, what class are they going to be in. At those induction events, we added in how are you going to travel to school. And we took that opportunity to re remind parents that actually most people choose to walk to school. It's the one of the most popular routes. Um, and we got their contact details. And we promised at the end of that, we said, what we'll do is we'll get in touch with you just before um, school starts and help you to plan your journey to school. Um, and we did this by sending out consultants uh, to each of the 36 schools we were working with. So they attended all of these induction events to get the contact details. Now, at the end of uh, July, the schools break up just to coincide with the British summer. I think it's about mid-August. Um, you can tell it's summer because the rain gets a little bit warmer. Um, so people go off on their holidays. Um, and then at the end of August, they will be coming back and starting to think about school starts in September. How are we going to get to school? So at that point, we set up a call centre uh, with six trained travel advisors, like uh, Karishma here. Uh, and we started calling up the parents who we'd been in touch with before. So we had um, over 1,000 contact details that we'd captured from these induction events. Uh, and they started calling. And they had to make 2,142 calls to get in touch with 922 people. So I think multiple calls per person. People weren't in, going to answer phone. Wrong numbers sometimes. So a significant amount of work. Once you get speak to those 922 people, so 433 of them were then happy to fill out the full survey, give us that baseline data. And 400 were happy and wanted to have those personal travel planning conversations with our, with our trained advisors. Um, so that was our real our first point of helping people to choose which route they might take to school. Of those 400, um, we sent out 348 of the travel packs. Um, some of the others didn't want the information sent out or they went online. Uh, within those packs, we had things like um, local cycling and walking routes. We had uh, local activities, road safety information. 
And um, one of the most important and most interesting pieces of uh, information there was these personalised school maps that we did. Veronica mentioned about um, maps earlier. We started for each school creating this bespoke map. We took the school in the middle, we plotted the postcodes of where people lived so that we could find out where people were likely to be walking from. And then we talked to people who were currently going to the school and walked to school to find out where were the popular routes. Uh, and then we marked on things such as traffic crossings. Uh, and in the pink section here is areas where you could go and park your car and then walk 10 minutes into school. So we designed these for 36 schools and then sent them out so they could give them out to the parents of um, the people who are starting school for the first time. And we found that actually most schools came back to us and said, these are brilliant, can you do us some more because we want to give them to all parents. So these worked really well. Uh, and that was really the main, the first section of our, of our approach, which is about that time when people are planning um, their journeys, give them personal, relevant, timely information. But what we know in terms of behavior change is that giving people information doesn't always lead to actually changing behavior. In fact, actually, it can be quite inefficient in, in converting people. What we do know works relatively well is showing people doing that behavior. So seeing other people, people like me, walking, cycling, if people see that, then they can, uh, they're much more likely to change their behavior. So what we wanted to do was use that start of term to really get everyone out walking and cycling. And the way we did that was by using the beat the street um, intervention. Now, I think in the Gdansk presentation, you'll see a lot more pictures of how that actually worked. Um, but I'll just give you a, a quick introduction to it. Um, as I think Veronica and William had also mentioned, you turn the, the whole community into a walking and cycling game. So we have our local area. This is Felton within Hounslow. And the beatboxes, um, the things on the lampposts were placed all around the area. And for example, say I live down in this um, this house down here, the little red house there. If I was journeying to school, and my school was near Feltham High Street, so number two, as I leave house in the morning, I might go along, and I tap my card on the first beat box, and as I go to the second one, I've now earned 10 points, and then 20, and then 30. So your points go up, and you're earning points as you're going. You've got a little card. You can go onto the website, and then type in your number and see how many points you've earned. And then your points also count towards your school. So we have... Uh, cut off the top just there, but um, the first section is the number of points they've earned in total as a school. The second column is the total average points, and the third column is the total number of people within the school taking part. And we had leaderboards for the schools who walked the furthest and the schools who walked the furthest per person. So if you had a smaller school, they could still compete against even the bigger schools. And we had prizes of £500 for each of those um, areas. And that worked really well to get the schools involved. But actually, as soon as it started, people just got caught up in the game. And probably the most important thing was when you tap the box, it beeps and it flashes. And that was enough to get people engaged, enjoying it, and wanting to tap it every single day. So we ran that throughout October and November. Um, and we had 21 schools taking part in Beat the Street. Uh, and over 11,000 people. Now, I've done a lot of physical activity interventions over the past sort of six or seven years, and I've never done anything where we've got 11,000 people engaged and doing something. Um, so it was really good at getting that, that scale. Uh, and we had about 55% children and a really high percentage of adults taking part, which, again, was excellent in terms of trying to change family behaviours rather than just one individual. Uh, and we walked over 40,000 miles... I'll, um, I'll leave you to see how far Gdansk walked, but we had a friendly competition and there was a clear winner in the end. Uh, so we had some great feedback from people uh, who were taking part, both on social media um, and when we were out talking to schools. Um, people loved taking part and loved sharing that they were taking part. Uh, my favourite story is the one I heard about outside one of our schools where there was a, a child who had a complete meltdown, a proper tantrum screaming because they didn't want to get into the car and be driven home by their parents. <laughs> They wanted to walk home like everyone else. And that was so good because that is changing the social norm. Suddenly, walking became the cool thing to do. And if you can change the social norm, then you are really on the right track to changing behaviour. Uh, so the whole area kind of came alive by um, taking part in the, this Beat the Street game. Um, what we've got here is a, a demonstration that shows it. So this is a, um, a timeline throughout the day. You can see the clock in the morning. That's four, five in the morning. And these are the taps as they were happening. So you see about 7, 8 o'clock, 
as we're going to the school time, you see more taps as that's that sort of commute to school. And actually quite a few people were going out once they dropped the ch children off, going on a, a walk after that. We actually show two days here. So the purple is a, a really high use day and the blue is a normal day. Um, the purple day we had, uh, it was Halloween. So we organized some Halloween walks that went around and so lots of community activity going on. And it's going through 10, 11, even straight up till midnight, people still playing. And the thing that's really interesting about this is you can get loads of really good data about the journeys people were doing, when they were tapping in, where were those um, key journeys. So did it change travel behavior when we ran it? Um, well, we asked people beforehand and afterwards, and uh, afterwards they told us that 67% of people walked more, 23% cycled more, and 55% of people reported using the car less after taking part. Now, I work in public health, so I care a lot about that physical activity element. Did it increase physical activity? Here you've got, again, three surveys. We asked before, which was the, the dark blue, straight after Beat the Street, and the light blue is two months after, so two months follow-up. And you can see this was the number of days which people did 30 minutes physical activity. We want people to be doing it on five days or more. At the start, 8% of people were doing nothing, zero or one days a week. Uh, by two months later, that had dropped to 5%. And if you look on the five days a week physical activity, that had increased from 58 through to 60 through to 70%. Um, and we'll be following up with those people again. Something that we didn't set out to, to really to achieve, but actually links quite nicely to what William was talking about earlier, is um, did people actually get fitter? Uh, what we found was that there was a statistically significant increase in walking speed. So at the start, people were walking 4.6 kilometers an hour between the boxes. <coughs> Seven weeks later, they're walking a whole kilometer faster. And there's, there's clear links between walking speed and fitness and then health. So just to finish and kind of reflect on one element that I think went, um, went quite well and, and an element of it that didn't work quite as well, when we were trying to capture the contact details, there was different methods across the campaigns um, from us and others, and we trialled looking, uh, we tried sending out letters to parents to try and get them to take part, and kind of unsurprisingly, it didn't really work. We send out letters, ask people to take part, we got about a one, two, three percent response rate, but attending the induction events really did work. Because it was that one time when a parent really cares about doing the right thing. They don't want their child to turn up at the wrong time on the first day or in the wrong uniform. So by adding in active travel at that point, they took it as if it was one of the key elements um, as any other bits. So it worked really well at engaging them, getting them to sign up, giving their consent for us to speak to them so we could then talk to them at that later point. Um, I'm on the panel as well later, so I can answer more questions then. But um, if you do have any specific questions, please feel free or get in touch on email or on Twitter. Thank you.